there is nothing to compare it with. It's the most exhilarating place in the world. It's like being able to fly, just like growing wings. If it's in your blood, you, you can't get it out. You just want more. You put the earplugs in, the helmet goes on, everything goes quiet. You know it's ahead of you and everything else around you is forgotten. It's time to get on with the job. My mind goes completely blank. And my mind just goes into madness. Well, it all revolved around um, Mr. Aiken, the primary school teacher, really. And he did uh, put manners in as that man. You know, in my day, lad, and all that. But I think, you know, oh, it was a boy. Just, you know, if it was naughty, he used to give us the slipper. We know he was getting it because he used to warm it up on a radiator before he'd give us it. If it was naughty again, which was mostly me, I was naughty all the time, we used to have to um, pick stones up so the lawnmower won't run over them. He used to have his own putting green out the back of school, and we used to, that was our main job, was keeping the keeping the putting green right and mowing grass, so yeah. And then, yeah, it's a natural progression. I wanted to go and race him. I've still got my first engine I ever had. Suffer punch lawnmower engine. I mean, it's down there. Yeah, I just used to play with that. That's all I wanted to do. Oh, I, I wasn't bothered about, you know, I had a, had a few mates, but I wasn't bothered about, you know, girls. I'm still not bothered about girls, really. I mean, I'm not gay around, but I'm just, uh, you know, just rather play with lorries and tractors and engines. Still, I haven't really grown up. No, I haven't grown up. Yeah. Where are you? Right and down, boss. Yeah. Road races. A bit mad. That's time. Oh, you're mad. Um, what would you say? A tile short of a roof. One short of a six pack. A few slates adrift. We'd use that one a lot. Lights are on, but no one's on. I can imagine from the outside looking in, anyone that's racing the TT looks like the lights are on, but no one's on. <laughs> You're not a proper road racer until you've won a TT. I obviously aren't a proper road racer because I haven't won one. But I'm trying. I don't give in. <laughs> Barry Sheen wasn't a big fan, was he? He thought it was too dangerous, did he? There you go, a lager shandy drinking Southern Fufflers. There you go, that says it all, doesn't it? Yeah. I'll say we're away now. <laughs> I was only watching that the other night, the Dambusters. Yeah, it's mega that, Wallace Barnes. You know, the idea that got into that was, um... Ah, oh, not Napoleon. Who was your boy that used the battleships? Give him the name. Not Napoleon. Different things make 
different people happy, don't they? Some lads love going to the pub. I'm not being in the pub. Some lads love shagging. I don't like shagging. I don't mind it. I'm not into it. I'd rather just go and ride my motorbikes and my pushbikes, you know. It's whatever you're into, isn't it? <laughs> but it's all the same. Everybody would be the TT, wouldn't they? But different things make different people tick. And that makes me tick, and that's why I'm going to keep going. That's why I'm going to keep going until I've won one. I won five, that's my plan. I win five in a week. That's not been done before. So I've got to do that. And then that's it. I'll go find the next job to do. I've got another big goal. This is a massive... Is it, well, it's, it's massive. It's not massive, is it? It's not massive. People use that word, don't they? And you people... You tell you what people, word people use all the time. Unbelievable. Oh. You can't use that word, can you? Unbelievable. When a man... Like I've said this before, when a man eats his own head, I will then hold my hands up and say, right, that was unbelievable, because I can't believe a man can eat his own head. But, like we say, never say never. Unbelievable! Absolutely unbelievable! Evil Knievel was a big sort of stuntman at the time, and uh, I had Stars and Stripes suit and I had Stars and Stripes helmet, and I thought it was Evil Knievel, you know. And my dad used to build me a ramp, and I used to jump 14 toy buses where Evil Knievel tried to jump the 14 real buses, and I wrote to Jim will fix it for him to do a jump with, with him, and. Uh, Never been replied back, the miserable old goat, but uh, it's always been in me. I don't know any different. I'm not really interested in anything else, you know, football, cricket or anything. It's just been bikes all the way through my life. He's still a little boy at heart. He's crackers, really. When I met him, he just finished motocross and he was wanting to get into racing bikes. And he always said, you know, I'm going to do an Isle of Man TT race one day. And he said, I just want to win a TT and I'll, I've got it under my belt and that's it. I'll, you know, I'll never do it again. And he won his first 250 race and we were like, oh, that's it, he's going to finish now. And I thought, thank God for that. But, you know, it just makes that bug grow even bigger, I think. Even then, when I was 10 years old, I used to watch it and it used to just blow me away. I used to think, you know, that's going to be a bit of me one day, you know, I'm going to win one of these. And... If I'd have been sat there then and somebody had said, you know, I'd have 15 wins, you know, he'd have probably, <laughs> probably laughed at him and fell off the wall, you know, but uh, here I am with 15 wins. But I still get that, Ooh, you know, jitters now and, you know, like TT's coming, TT's coming, you know, you're building up, building up, get apprehensive, nervous, and months before the TT, you know, and then I think about it, it makes me skip a heartbeat, really. And then I have to have the house immaculate, my garage has got to be immaculate, everything's got to be at its place, I'm all alone, make sure that's all right, clean the cars. So just in case anything does happen, then. Everything's ready, you know, so... But I definitely think about it, and, you know, it's got to cross your mind. It has to cross your mind, because it's there all the time. It's a reality that, you you know, you might not come back. John McGillis, 17.43, 127, under the lap record from a standing start. For two incredible weeks each summer, generations of men and women have made the pilgrimage to the Isle of Man to pit themselves against the track which has achieved international status and become synonymous with speed and glory. At a time when the maximum permitted speed on English roads was just 20 miles per hour and racing strictly prohibited, a band of enthusiasts intent on testing their bikes and themselves to the limits of speed and endurance gathered on the Isle of Man. And in 1907, the Tourist Trophy was born. You see, look at the suspension. You see? And then put it the other way. Watch that. Keep watching. It'll do something. See? Look at that. Hey. Me and Guy's got this typical father-son relationship. <laughs> yeah. Guy knows best and I knows best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get a brew on. You see, steady cam, that's what it is. That, must have shockers in it or something. Is what? See, when you was holding that thing, you can jar, but that takes all the jar out of the camera, doesn't it? <laughs> it do you? I bet it's do you, that, innit? Go on, how much is that arm there, then? <laughs> 1400? Yeah. Fuck off. 14 grand. 14 grand. Fucking hell. Fucking hell. see that? 14 grand. My first TT was 74, riding a Gus Kuhn Norton Commando production bike. 
I thought I'm going to be a TT superstar here. So <clears throat> I set off from the how old, down how old was you? I was uh Yeah, how old was I? 1974, 47. What's that then? I don't know. 74, 47, fire. Anyway, come uh, into Glen Ellen, hook Craig Willie's Hill, cranked it in, down, 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 no further to go, bang, straight over the bank. The bike finished up in three bits, and I brought me back, and I was back at the TT again the following year. Our worst crash ever, probably northwest, 2008, come off a black hill, lost the front on the apex of the corner. Not a lot of fast, maybe 120 mile an hour. Hit the curb with my ass at 120 mile an hour. And I walked away, walked away, no bother. The bike was nothing, we could have to salvage anything, everything was written off on it, everything. And um, I got away from that, but it scared me. It didn't scare me for life, it just. proper. I just thought, I just thought, another one of those moments, I just thought, oof. But I suppose that, you know, get it wrong, you're an inch out here, that's it. Yeah, we like that. <laughs> I'm not, like I said, a masochist, really. I'm not purposely going out there trying to kill myself. No, no, definitely not. The, the opposite, really. I want to succeed, you know. But that's the buzz that you get out of trying to do that. You do end up in that position where it looks like it's going to be game over at any moment. But those positions, money cannot buy the buzz that you get there. That thing that you get that you think, oof, that's it, game over. You don't go into panic or out, you just, oof, this is it, game over. Been in about four of them since I've been racing, and I've been racing ten years now. And all of those moments, I think three of those moments are at the TT. I come to the gym a couple of times a week and uh, get out on my mountain bike a couple of times a week. I enjoy my training and it keeps me focused on the job and I don't like anything to sort of let my riding slip if, you know, it, a bit of training's what it takes and that's what I do. I've always been a bike fanatic, but my parents have always been against it. And uh, by the time I got to 15, I think I'd wore my parents down that much. They were a bit concerned about me getting a road bike, so they got me a trials bike. And uh, the minute I was 17, I, I took my test and got a road bike, so it backfired a bit on my parents. But, you know, I met a group of lads that blagged a caravan for free. It was an absolute wreck. Dragged it all over the country, it was falling apart. and. We got to race meetings, had a few beers, had a barbecue, raced all day. You know, it was just great to experience that side of it. Natural ability pulls you through to a certain level, but if I'm in a race and it comes down to a tight battle and, you know, I lose the race basically through fitness or something, you know, I'd be devastated with myself, so I, I get very obsessed about what I'm doing. And there's only one outcome for me, to win the race. Every one of the 37 and three quarter miles of public roads that makes up the course has created a champion or hero. Over 200 corners must be negotiated up to six times to complete the world's toughest road race in the fastest time. There are five races over a week, culminating with a senior TT. With speeds of up to 200 miles per hour and the opportunity for disaster around every corner, its dangers are set in stone. To date, 231 riders have lost their lives on the TT course. To win just one TT is an outstanding achievement. The legendary Joey Dunlop has an unmatched 26 wins. John McGinnis holds the outright lap record, and Phil McCallan is the only rider to have won four out of the five races run each year. No one has ever won five out of five. Sorry, I meant Guy Martin. So the laundry didn't come back. <laughs> you know, I get told off for not saying the right thing, or doing this, or doing that, and not wearing the right clothes, and what have you. And you know, and uh, just sort of gets on top of you sometimes. Well, not gets on top of you, but he just takes the, takes the fun out of it all. Whereas Wilson, for me, you know, he's doing it for the same reasons I'm doing it. You know, doing it to enjoy it and doing it to win. And I see it as David and Goliath. Um, that's, I think that's what motivates me in many ways. That's perfect. Yeah. The guy come back to a small team and can win. Could you call it a deal, Wilson? There weren't really a lot of paper signing going on. Just a firm handshake, I think, Wilson. I suppose I should say, to have a gentleman's agreement, we need two gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't have said I was a gentleman, in a way. So, uh, thank you. It's, it's, the guy's all right. 
<laughs> yeah, but we won't go as far as gentlemen. Oh, well. <laughs> you knew when I was wanking, didn't you? Oh, yeah, you should regularly wake up and see a guy pulling one out. Yeah. I had to go back to bed for a few minutes while I finished him saying that. Yeah, because I used to sleep above the cow and I, <laughs> I slept to... above you, didn't I? Yeah. yeah. You could tell. I didn't really know that until I broke my ankle right back. I remember that. Yeah. Your toes go, do you know? When, when you're wanking. Yeah. So and you, you see a guy's toes twitching. And, and you know I was on it. In the morning, his toes would be going, thinking, yeah. give me five more minutes. Yeah. Grab Get a load off. <laughs> And the build-up to the TT every other race meeting is a chance to perfect the bikes, impress new sponsors, and develop the speeds needed to compete on the Isle of Man. We're not here for any lap times to fuck off. We're not bothered whether we're last or first. We're not bothered. We're just here to see if I can. Just whoever's built them up. Who built them up? You need to be a good mechanic to, you know, to work with me. And I'm a bit awkward to get on with, I suppose, because I'm very particular how I want stuff doing. Most motorbike riders just, you know, get on it and turn the throttle, but I like to know what makes that bike tick. You know, I like the whole idea behind the whole internal combustion engine and the way stuff's made, and you need to have a bit of mechanical sympathy, don't you? You can't go charging in there like a bull in a china shop. It's all going to end in tears, isn't it? You end up breaking gearboxes and blowing engines up and all that sort of caper. Still no quick shifters. No, we don't know anyone that's got one. No. Mechanical failures are what all riders dread. Sometimes they're over-revved, and sometimes something breaks. Oh, my God. You know, if a part breaks, then it's just bad for everybody. And the TT, particularly because where you only get one hit, and you've got to wait 12 months to have another go. I don't have heroes until Chris Mayo. Yeah, he's the boy. Mad in a way. You know, lovely bloke. You know, his dogs. He nearly got his dog to talk. Nearly. Likes his grandfather clocks. Makes his own wine, he's got a grapevine growing out his garden through a window that he's chiselled out in his conservatory that grows into his conservatory around there. You know, gets his own grapes, makes his own wine. That's a boy, that, isn't it? Not many folk do that. I got an entry to the TT in 73, and uh, I crashed in both races. So I saw more of Noble's Hospital and <laughs> than the track, really. What I do basically is take a, a road engine and turn it into a race engine. My biggest boast, I think, was in the 100th year of the TT, every single winning engine or lap record machine came out of this workshop. You know, Guy, I think, has got the best bikes he ever could. I shall obviously do my best, and Guy obviously will put the finishing touches to it. If he's happy, he'll be there. I have every confidence that if things work in our favour, we're going to come away with a result. One thing I'm concerned about is we mustn't start thinking it's our turn, because it never is your turn. But I think the ingredients are right, if they're mixed properly. Northern Ireland's Northwest 200 race meeting also takes place on public roads and is the very last chance to get the bikes ready for the TT. Heads down for the lights above the track. And when they go out, this race will be underway. Michael Dunlop's been mugged, hasn't he? On board with Michael Dunlop then, just looking what was going on in front of him. Where you see him coming down over the hill. 165 miles an hour. That's a man's corner, that. Michael Dunlop and his brother William are the next generation of a road racing dynasty that began with their uncle Joey and father Robert Dunlop. Joey Dunlop, who are the biggest road racers, I think that the, the world has ever had, you know, so, you know, the inspiration I got from them was so much. And growing up with two people, you'd never seen them as heroes or superstars, you just seen them as uh, two normal people. Joey blew out the competition when in 2000, aged 49, he won a third hat trick of TT races. Over the line, Joey he was killed three weeks later in a little known race in Estonia. Over 50,000 mourners attended his funeral. His brother Robert was almost killed in 1998 when his rear wheel collapsed in an accident at the TT. But raced for 10 more years until his death in 2008 during the final practice lap at the Northwest 200. He knew the circuit, he knew it well, and a mechanical failure happened, and, and it happens to, you know, the best of riders, which was, you know, it was a sad loss to the sport, a sad loss to us, you know, but for some reason, I just thought that Saturday, then I, I wanted to ride the 250. Tears of joy, and look at Michael Two days after witnessing his father's death, Michael went on to win the race, 
and reduce the onlookers to tears. What must be going through his mind right now? Because that was more than a race. You're only a young man, you know what I mean? All you have for life is a bit of crack, you know what I mean? And you don't think you're going to have to bring on a lot of stuff. So, like, I turned in from a boy to a man in a very short space of time. You know what I mean? I hope they're up there now and uh, they're being looked after. Connor Cummins, the Isle of Man rider, he's fast, really very fast. Oh, oh, he's down! Cummins, he's down! I took the lead from Ryan, just as I was coming out of the corner. The back end sort of stepped out on me and high sided me over the top of the bike. Um, and I was, you know, really, really lucky to come away unhurt there. I just had to pick myself up. I got, you know, dusted myself down straight out on the bike in the next race and fall off a horse, get straight back on it. Guy has taken a tumble too. I'm all right. I mean, bloody hell. It's not bad, is it? I mean, that's a bit damn. I've just done, I've done that and my finger, let me see my finger. Didn't have my eye on the ball. You know, so much going on. And uh, yeah, lost my fault. Hit the curve on the inside, took the front, ended up in the grass. Part was all okay. We had to put a new rear do. Rear do. Engine cover, water hose. We didn't wreck it. Michael Dunn up next, uh, Ryan Farquhar, number 77, someone's blown oh. up. That's Guy Martin. Guy Martin, the engine is gone. In the second race, Guy over revs the bike and blows up his engine. He's completely out of the race. This was not a good meeting here as far as results are concerned. We had a couple of things that didn't go according to plan. Uh, the, the, go a couple, a bit more than a couple, but yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it has been a learning curve. You may think we're a bit old to be learning, but we're still learning. The upside guy will go to the TT with that bike and two brand new engines. Brand new. Speed's not bad. We need to work on speed a little bit, but it's not bad. The uh, stability's good, ambulance good, the tyres are good. We need to work on a few issues, but I think we have it. I'm going on my ferry's booked. I'm going in the camper, because otherwise you sat at home. You know, you sat at home just twisting your thumbs, you know, waiting for a phone call. So you might as well be there among it all. For over a hundred years, the Isle of Man has attracted riders and race fans to watch their heroes race the mountain course. Modest prize money means that this close-knit band of brothers ride purely for the love of the sport and the glory of winning. If you're born on the Isle of Man, you're sort of brought up with motorbikes and racers. You've got the island going from black and white, quiet, rural, country roads. All of a sudden, they've got teams of bikers going down them. It's just lovely to see the island come alive. Stories, stories, comfort stories, spinning away to the height of their glory. It's a festival, it's a coming together of everyone who appreciates motorcycling. The stories that are told as you sit at the hedge, or the marshals in groups around the island, are, are all lived and relived every year, and we never get tired of swapping them. Let's just say there's a large segment of the motorcycling population in America that knows well about the TT, as I do, and probably have put it on their, what we call a bucket list, things to do before you kick the bucket, to go to the TT, and that, that's why I'm here. I had the opportunity to come. It's something I've always wanted to do. My father and I have talked about coming here together for years and never did. Um, he's passed away, so it's, it's on me to, to come and enjoy the experience and share it with him however I can later on, perhaps. Well, I wear these leather for 27 years now, and uh, at least 27 years more I will uh, bring the leathers to the CT. My name's Karen Anderson, and I've come all the way from Australia to watch Cameron Donald race TT. We sat above here in, in a room on the balcony, and we watched the guys coming around that corner, and there was a lamp post there, and the lamp post was padded, and they would come round dipping, and then they'd do that in and sure. out to get round the lamppost and that to me was hot in my mouth, hot in my mouth, hot in my mouth. Brilliant. Yeah, well, I know what can happen. <laughs> <laughs> With her on the back, you won't get too quick, else you get beat up. <laughs> it's a very hairy place, very fast. 
to watch the bravest men in the world. And, and if it doesn't excite you, you're not alive. That's, and that's a fact. Within hours of arriving, Guy is unhappy with the bike's suspension, in particular the swinging arm because of its importance for a fast wheel change. Wilson, can we put the other swing in our bin and get Simon to change it? It's shit. It's going to go wrong. The bike was given to me in the first place, Wilson. It wouldn't be going through this problem. And I did say this in the first place. So. Guy has upset the authorities too because of his plans to work on the bikes away from the paddock. I was expecting there to be tension because that's why I've, been, I've stayed out of the way. I've, I've got my airbed that goes in the back of my van. I've just been staying in my van. When it comes to how I want bikes preparing, if they aren't right, that's it. I'll just pack in and go home. I won't stick my neck out if things aren't exactly how I want them. And I'm so meticulous with things. But we're going to meet in the middle. We're going to meet in the middle, aren't we? I can't, I can't have it all my way because, I mean, Wilson's bought the bikes and put a lot of money into the bikes. You know, but I'm the one risking my neck out there, and that's why my head needs to be right. And Wilson always has said from the, from the off that my head needs to be right. And then to get my head right, it needs to be my way, which is doing bikes with no interruptions. But yeah, I think we're going to have to meet in the middle, me and Wilson. The bikes will have to be back here at a certain time, and then I'll have to do certain bits of nodding and smiling and agreeing with people. There's a contract, and the team gets X number of pounds, so they expect Guy to be professional. And Guy sometimes makes statements that uh, they don't like. Uh, people like him, maybe it's because there's a bit of a rebel about him, uh, and so on. So we have to, we just have to make do with what we have. If I dictated the guy, it wouldn't work. It's just a mechanic who is a brilliant rider, a brilliant motorcyclist. Uh, the bikes are ready to race, but he has to have his touch to the bikes. He knows I've given him everything he has asked for. Uh, so, you know, it has to work this time. And the bike will be checked and checked again for anything. And uh, then you're in the lap of the gods. If you get this corner right and make a proper job of it, you, know, you can make 10 seconds up because you know you don't break or let go of the throttle for the next three miles. But it's a man's corner, get it wrong, you're um, balascari. Balascari, you see the sign there. So yeah, get it wrong and it's going to work. But you don't think about things like that, do you? you know, if you want a fast lap out, you've got to um, throw your balls to the wall, as it says. Weather. After a bright start today, it will turn cloudy later this morning. Then, although staying mostly dry this afternoon, there could be a little patchy light drizzle possible. Guy Martin's real rivals this year will be manifold. Cameron Donald's always been a threat. He's a bit highly strong, but he's fast, real fast. Connor Cummins is going to be a big threat. Connor Cummins, local marksman. He's fit as young. Uh, Ryan Farquhar has gone ahead of Joy Dunlop in national wins in Ireland, and it's phenomenal. The Dunlops are coming strong. Michael's really aggressive and got that will to win. No, I definitely won't want to get in a ring with him anyway. Keith Moore again, he's uh, not going to lead, you know, he's just chomping at that bit to go fast and win. You never know what Bruce you're going to get. If Bruce wakes up in the morning and says he wants to beat us all, he'll probably won't beat us all. You never bet against John McGuinness. He's the man at the minute. He's the man with the results on the board. He's the man when you go quicker, he usually raises the bar and goes a bit quicker again. Nobody knows how fast John can go. Nobody has actually taken John to that next level. Yeah, you never underestimate anyone. Someone could come out from the woodwork that you just didn't really expect and, you know, shock you. I don't know much about Hutchinson, to be truthful. He's one of the quiet men of the sport. Just does the job, I think. It reminds me a bit of myself, you know, 10 years ago. He's absorbing everything, understanding what it takes to win a big race now. Guy, you know, I think every man and his dog in the world wants a flipping guy mine to win. And there's no question he's going to win one. He's definitely got the talent. But uh, there's some ingredient missing at the moment, and it just seems to find him. He's going to be the best man that's going to win on the day, at the end of the day. And uh, nobody wants to win it more than I do. 
As speeds increase, so do the dangers. And it was this that lost the TT its world championship status. But winning at the TT requires more than just speed. It relies on mechanical perfection, supreme mental and physical endurance, a huge dose of good fortune, and a very fast pit stop. A tank of fuel and a set of tires will only last two of the four or six laps required. Pit stops count toward the overall lap time and can make or break a rider's chances. It's 33. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. But if we have one mistake, it goes to 40. The swing and in the bike now isn't safe to do a, a fast pit stop. It just happened, the bike I had last year was sold to a bloke on the Isle of Man. And I begged and pleaded with him to see if we can borrow the swing and back out of his bike to put back in my new bike for this year. So he says, pop up and make it this afternoon. And then we'll go tomorrow morning and put it back in the bike. Look at you, you're out. Guy's father has decided not to come to the race this year. It's a bit of an hard field to tech, really, my dad not coming. You know, he's a good man to have involved because he's got so much experience around here. He's rode the TT for 15 years and he knows exactly how things need to be. That would give me confidence if he was involved. And now he's not here. It's not fuck the job, but it's, um, it's made it a lot harder. And it took my eye off the ball a little bit. But what do I do? You can cry about it, can you? Martin Finnegan, really good friend of mine in racing, in racing. I was at his wedding in, I think it had been a November time of 2007. Yeah, 2007. And then the funeral was in April time of 2008, you know. Teammate of mine, Darren Lindsay, was killed in 2005. Friend of mine used to do his engines, Richard Britton, he was killed in 2006. You could go on. I just think... You know, your time's up. You know, and I think you've got to be in this line of work. You know, and that's why I sort of don't believe in having any commitments of any sort. Because if I, if I did have responsibilities as wife, kids, mortgage, and all that sort of care, but I couldn't give this job, you know, as in racing the TT, I couldn't give it me all. And I want to give it me all. But yeah, before I can start thinking about winning races, we've got a lot of practice to get through. You know, we've, yeah, five nights of practice to get through. That's not going to be easy. It's a lot of work to do on the bikes. And that's when my dad was going to come in. It's not just going to go straight in the bike. A lot of things I'll need making to get that swinging out to suit the new bike. But if it was easy, every man and his dog would be out, wouldn't they? We'll chill out later on. Just find, I find a different place every night to keep in my van. Just get my air bed blown up in the back of my van. Bit of a wank and go to sleep, you know. <laughs> Proper. Proper. There's no, you know, people get all, it's not a crime, is it? Have a while, you know. You never get complacent with the TT, you know, there's always something you can learn. And, you know, if you get that way and overconfident, it'll bite you. I just went up and had a little moment on my own looking down the road because the road was shut. There wasn't a sound apart from the birds just tweeting away. And that's just something real special about the track itself. You know, I was just looking down thinking, you know, next week I'm going <laughs> to, in the race, I'm going to be going down there at 200 mile an hour plus, you know. The emotion you feel when you roll up onto that start line and you're getting waved off 10 seconds apart, it's just, it's just unbelievable, you know. It's like nothing else I've ever experienced. It's not about beating the next guy, it's about who beats the track. This TT is the most powerful race you'll ever do in your life. I love it, like, it's, it's, it's legal. People often ask, you know, why do you road race? Because um, circuit racing is fast, you can get a buzz, but it's not the same. Circuit racing is rock climbing with a rope. It's dangerous, but there is some room for error. You slip before you've got a rope. Road racing is like free climbing. You know, you're climbing up that same mountain, you're on a course, but there's no room for error. If you make a mistake, it's, it's gonna be, you know, well, it could be serious injury or worse. You're doing maybe 170, 180 mile an hour, going through fast bends with trees, hedges, brick walls. It's the greatest thing. And you realize the dangers before you put the leg over the bike. I mean, at the top of Bray Hill, before I go out, you know, you have lots of strange thoughts in your mind and you're nervous and you're worried. 
But as soon as you set off and you get the tap off the start marshal to go down Bray Hill, that's gone. And then once you're actually out here, the noise, the wind, the physical strain on your body, there's nothing like it. It's just you put yourself through hell and you frighten yourself so many times. But that is the draw. Out there, you can't fake it. You know, there's nothing that you can do that isn't putting you in the moment. And this is it. This, you know, especially if you ride two wheels. You know, this is about as, uh, as difficult as it gets. I mean, people talk about extreme sports. <laughs> there's nothing more extreme than road racing. One split second. You know, somebody like Joey Dunlop, 31 years of career, 26 TT wins. All those other race wins, all those world championships. One split second. No room for error on the TT course. Of all road racing circuits, it is the toughest and most unforgiving. With an average five deaths for every mile, only a lucky few have crashed and escaped unharmed. Milky Quail is one of the lucky ones. Your life revolves around the TT because it's such an immense, passionate thing. Whether you're on the track or off the track, it is a life and death thing. I know it sounds crazy and stuff. I mean, I haven't raced around here now for, what, eight, nine years? And I still now struggle with life because I can't do it, you know, I can't, I can't get me buzz. It's like, you've, you've done the ultimate, and once you can't have that ultimate, then you're a bit like a, you know, a drug addict sort of thing. You just can't, you can't get out of your system. You love it. When I'm sat at the side of the track, you just want to do it, you know, it gives you, you think, yeah, 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 yeah. And then, so obviously if you keep yourself busy and whether it's blooming, sweeping the floors or emptying the bins or, you know, taking all the riders around or, you know, meeting dignitaries and taking press around it, it keeps my mind off it, really. Milky looks after the newcomers and shows them around the course. It can take three years of competing to learn it and at least that long to build up the confidence needed to push themselves to the limits. It's all about confidence. You need to be confident where the corners go and how fast you can go around that corner to build up your speed. So I'm still experimenting on how fast I can go a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. As I build up and get used to the corners and the bumps and the rises and the tipping points and the grids and everything, hopefully I'll keep going a bit faster. Get over it, get over it. Oh, in by the hedge, transfer back over the bike again. Oh, into here, and guess what? There's another one here. Oh, that takes you three years to get right. After only two years of competing, Jenny Tenmouth is the fastest woman ever around the course. You definitely feel like you shouldn't be doing it. It's quite bizarre, you feel. Um, you do feel cheeky and a bit naughty, you know, to be blasting around the roads. But I think that, again, that's half the fun. And, like, when you set off down Bray Hill, it's just a massive big grin. It's like, oh, it's just... I can come up here, all I'm thinking about is the next corner that's coming up, which is called Balagheri. Um, it's affectionately known as Balascari because it is. It's so, so scary. It's so fast, it's the most important, but also the most dangerous corner on the circuit. The big problem with Balagari is it's on site on your entry point. So as I'm coming up to here now, I'm still hard on the gas, still on the gas, still on the gas. At the 30 mile an hour signs here now, this is where I come off the gas. I come down one gear effectively. I get my head out of the bubble and my head's getting ripped off my shoulders. But at that point also, I'm trying to look to, for my peel in point, but I still can't see it. I know it goes to the right, but where do I turn in? As soon as I see the curve on the inside, I lay the bike on its side and drive it, okay? And just poof, fire through right by the curve. So, so fast. Averaging 131.57 miles per hour, John McGinnis is still the fastest man around the course. A hundred years ago, the first race was won at just 38 miles per hour. Throughout its history, even riders with no hope of winning have come to break personal bests and challenge the island's famous course. Riders are always chasing faster and faster lap times. In first place, this is Nick Pro. He's still second. I just think it's got a certain addiction about it. Once you get here, you couldn't let it go. Then you know you were looking at the ultimate lap times all the time. And, uh, I always set out to beat myself more than anybody else, you know. Every year I just thought I'd do faster and faster and faster, which I was actually doing, unfortunately, until the time of my accident, which was really you no know, fault of my own. It's just one of them freak things, you know. 
In 2009, while leading the race, a hare ran onto the track, causing Nick to crash his sidecar at 160 miles per hour. I think it just caught, damaged the front part of the fair, and, and uh, caught and hit me in the face, and that was it. And I had, obviously, the bike turned immediately right then, and that was it, it straight into the trees. And yeah, we were lucky to get away with that one. If we have a, an injury or a fatality, I tend to sort of want to stop because, yeah, I do, I do. I feel like a drug dealer sometimes because I'm preparing these engines for these people to go and hurt themselves with. And even though it's, you know, touch wood, not my fault, you know, the people who deal in drugs are worse than the people who take them. And so last year we had such a terrible time. Um, I did so that I wouldn't carry on with the sidecars. And then the way Nick bounced back was just, I couldn't say no to him at all, you know, so we, we've got three engines all ready for him. We're doing two more. Um, his spirit's unbelievable. Nick himself won't be riding. Instead, his own race team will attempt to break the sidecar lap record, which has stood unbroken since his accident. It's a fine guy. Yeah, he's uh, some Good. problem with his license. Have you got a problem with your license, Gary? <laughs> Typically, Guy is nowhere to be found, and he won't be eligible to practice without his race license. Until he returns, the bike can't go through scrutineering. We don't know where he is, as usual. He'll be here in a bit, hopefully. <laughs> Guy Martin, where do you start? He is a maverick. <laughs> He's an eccentric. He's always got something good to say, although a lot of the time it comes out it's not broadcastable. He's a bit old school. He's a bit what we grew up with, what we used to be. Guy's a, a fabulous personality. I don't think Guy really knows exactly what he wants to do. He's got a lot of different loves in his life. I'd like to see him win around here, but if you're not careful, he'd run out of time. Guy's a colourful character. He's an attention seeker, isn't he? You know, he loves a bit of attention. He's had green shorts on for two years. I mean, they must be stinking and growing legs by now. But that's what racing's all about. We need characters in there, you know. Guy is what he is. I mean, he talks pure rubbish, but he's funny. Guy says it as it is. I think that's why he's so popular with people. He's not worried about upsetting the uh, hierarchy. Guy Martin's Guy Martin, and nobody would want him any other way. I mean, he is a true. Grit, and he's a John Wayne of motorcycle racing. At last, Guy returns after blowing up a friend's classic bike in the south of the island. There you are. Sorted. sorted now. Spot on. Alrighty. Thank you very much. Cheers, man. The roads will be closing in half an hour, and tonight's practice will start at 7 .30. Guy's race license approved. The team can finally make it through scrutineering with the bikes. Five minutes, ladies and gentlemen. Five minutes. <laughs> Last year, we come into the first pit stop and my eyes were on stalks. You know, you could see the whites in my eyes all the time. You come to TT and your body's unfamiliar with it to start with. Stuff's just going past so fast. Standing start like 125 mile an hour, you know, first lap, and it's like, I must be mad. It's spectacular, and when you've just, you know, plodded along on your road by thinking you were a legend riding fast, you, you know, it's like a totally different thing when you see the race bikes come through. You know, you might have driven to the pits that morning, so your top speed for the day so far is maybe 40 miles an hour. You let the clutch out, and within a couple of miles, you're pushing 200 miles an hour between, you know, stone walls and hedges, so it takes a bit to get your head up to speed. But then you settle down, you start relaxing and getting more and more comfortable with the circuit. 
you start going faster, you start becoming smoother, you start breathing properly. You do go into like this weird sort of state of mind where everything starts slowing down. You start moving your eye line, starts lifting so much and your brain starts working so much in ahead of yourself. You're thinking like maybe four or five corners ahead. It's all about momentum and keeping your rhythm up and not getting into any uh, stupid battles with people, you know, and you've got, you've got to be really using your head. I'm a real hard rider to ride with. If you, you only want to race off me, you know, I mean, you're going to have to be willing to wrap around a post, you know what I mean? And that's the way I race motorbikes, and uh, that's the way I push, and I'll push any man to the better end. If they want to play ball, you know, they can play with me, you know? Listen, the bike come and the six gear, never close throttle. This is uh, it's also for me, you know. I ride the bike for many years, I say, Wow, wow, really wow. Even after all these years, to talk to somebody about the Ardaban TT course, the hair stands up on the back of your neck and you remember. And I'll never ever forget my first flying lap at the TT going over St. Ninian's Crossroads down down Bray Hill and I thought I'd come off the end of the world. Really, I thought I'd ridden off the end of a cliff. You, know, you just feel you could fly, really. And most of the time you do. <laughs> Everybody wants to know. has been impounded because on his return he has illegally ridden it through the town. I've got to go get Bolton. What, to ride it through the old area there or ride it through the town? Uh, ride it through the town, the town probably. Oh. You're supposed to read that mate before you go out. But I didn't see you as you were playing to the grid. Oh. That's telling you not to do what you did. <laughs> Really, really, Mr. Craig, this, this, this is where you come in. <laughs> team back, team back. I'm going to blame you, Charles. Yeah, I'm blaming you, yeah. Oh, fucking mega. Mega. Where's Rob? He's got his arm. Let's be perfect. No problem. Oh, yeah. More badges? Yeah. Oh, Every man. year. Good man. Good man. Guy will get his bike back. Once he apologizes. Who do I go see for a volcan? Can I take me can I take me bike? Can I take me bike? Do you want a chip? I don't mind. I know you're on a diet. Okay. Help yourself. Thank you very much. Well, I'll get in there. Right, good luck to you, boy. Thanks, lads. Alright. Hey, right, boss. Job done. Cheers, boy. Okay, we are. On the front of that shell, just pushing the front, and then accelerate over. Oh, oh. That fucking mustard, I like, boys. Is that got the same sprocket carrier? Yeah. If there's one thing that I like, it's riding around on a motorbike. I'm a speaking when I want to sing it. I want one first prize, two and six. I know all the dirt tracks, dirty tricks. I'm a marble. Absolutely two weeks of my life. It's just something that.
that to me is like the World Cup. Boom. It's just 50 years of my life is 100, 100, 100 weeks. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's just unbelievable. The atmosphere the friends have made from all around the world, you see every year, you lose some, you gain some. It's just something special. People say to me, oh, you've got children, you, you know, you shouldn't be allowing them to do it. But you took racing away from Dan and it, it would just be the end of Dan's wheels and I can't do that to him, you know. He's my husband, I love him, so I have to support him. You're up on the grandstand sitting together, you know, with the rest of the families and the rest of the wives, you know, you're all nervous, but you kind of have to sort of have a little joke and a laugh and it's amazing the strength that comes from within, really, with, with all of everybody together, you all sort of club together and get yourself through it, really. The road race is great, the fence is always the same thing. Every single one of them is the same thing. So it'll never happen to me. But somewhere in there, they know very well that it can happen to them. And between those two places, there's a lot of ways of dealing with it. I won the same crash helmet for the last 11 years, and you know, I always wear a certain pair of socks throughout the whole fortnight. And I always uh, drop a penny down my leathers as well before the start of every race, yeah. It makes no difference whatsoever, but. I'll wear pink knickers if it was going to make me win. <laughs> you your uh, in that, yeah? I ain't got out on my back. You need a pass. I got out. Can't go past without a pass. No? No, that's the rule. That's the pit area, you see. Yeah, I'm right. You can't. That's what you need. You need this. One of them. You yeah. take that one. I'll yeah. stick it back on the fence here. Cheers, mate. I'll pass back on the fence. Cheers, mate. Okay, you do. I'll stick it down there, boy. Yeah. yeah. There's no question that the Isle of Man TT represents uh, kind of the last bastion of the freedom of choice. And to come to a place like this and to have something so truly, you know, potentially dangerous uh, be welcome, really, is refreshing. It's charming. It's, it's all of the things that should be allowed to go on other places. I mean, for human beings, life isn't a dress rehearsal. You only get one lap. Why not make it a good one? This is where I start the mountain climb. So this one I have to slow down for. Back down to second gear. Boom! I get into the wall, into there, as I come through here, the bump just there, bang! So we run now up through this little right-hand kink here, still flat, still flat, on the power, 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 underneath the wall, off the power, down one gear, boom! Back on the power now to drive, under, drive, 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 back down to second gear, boom, boom! Back on the power now, pull the bike straight, get up, get up, get the driving on, up towards these little left-hand kinks here. So this first one here, just get back underneath there. <laughs> Out towards the tree on the right-hand side of the road, right to here, OK? And we run up to now to go to Guthrie's, OK? Guthrie's is the third most important corner on the circuit. We've got three left-hand bends here, OK? But it's very steep. This is the one, get the first one right, get into that one, into there, out to the right line, back into number two, out to number three, just there. See the corner? On the brakes hard. Down three gears, one, two, three. Back into there, back on the power, drive it through. Right towards the white line, back over towards the external white line, back in then underneath this one just here, feather in the throttle, there we go, lovely, nice wheelie. Bang! Over the next seven days, there will be many scrapes and near misses, seven cracked vertebrae, four broken ribs, five life-threatening incidents, two bruised lungs, and unfortunately, much worse. Where's Cam? In there. It's a plan. <laughs> <laughs> what? Tea. Yeah. Get us tea and get early start in the morning. Boys, no. Is that the plan, Wilson? Sorry? What's the plan? These boys are asking what the plan is. You the, word the plan is you raiding the bike. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. I think so. It's got on. Well, obviously, a fair bit of mist up here in Douglas at the moment around the area here, but it is clear up on the top. Of the Starting off with the TT Superbike race, six laps of the course, 236.38 miles. A reminder, this is a time trial. They go at 10 second intervals, so they're racing the clock just as much as each other. Most of all, of course, they race themselves. They race tradition. They race the history of the mountain course. We're one minute away from the start of racing at this year's TT. The laws of average tell me he's going to win. I would like him to win the first race, because I believe that will settle them if it wins the first race, they won three or four. 
I really believe in it. And it is a Suzuki that sets us going. There goes Bruce Anstey with Miss still rolling along Glen Crutchery Road, but we are racing. And there is the number one machine of Bruce Anstey looking very compact there through Union Mills. And there is John McGuinness, the fastest man in the history of the mountain course. And here's Hutchie with two wins last year, across on a superbike. And next off is number eight, 28 years of age. Here comes Guy now. He's fast down Bray Hill. It's Anstey. And here we go. We're on. Two together. John McGuinness leads on the road ahead of Bruce Anstey. Number six, Cameron Donald's closing the gap between him and Keith Moore. They've got a battle on there. The advantage being held by Cameron Donald. But he is Guy Martin now, and he's quick. John McGuinness has had an amazing start to this race, but Connor Cummins, the local lad, is right behind him, only eight hundredths of a second down in second place. Back here in the grandstand, I can tell you from my screen that Connor Cummins has taken the lead, and Malaf on corrected time, a three-second lead over John McGuinness, but John clearly has problems because at the Solby speed trap, he's gone through at only 136.4 miles an hour. So clearly problems with John McGuinness and the big Honda. But off to Ramsey and Roy Moore. Well, they said it was going to be close, and it certainly is, because Guy Martin, see, oh my goodness, Guy Martin was nearly taken out there by Michael Dunlop, but it was close. Connor Cummins, number 10, leads by six seconds from Corey and Hutchinson. It's then in third place, Guy Martin, just one second down on Hutchinson. John McGuinness is a retirement on Solby straight. What a disappointment. The king of the mountain is out on the first lap, but off with the show. Number four, who is leading on the road. Number, number ten has increased his lead to 14 seconds over number four, Ian Hutchinson. We could see uh, Maxman on the top of the podium for the first time for several years. Cummins has got a fantastic lead now, 21 seconds. If he can just hang it together, there'll certainly be some Guinness drunk in the swan in Ramsey tonight. <laughs> Hutchinson's lap time, 130.496. So here's Connor now. Let's have a look at this. Oh, it's 131.511 by Connor Cummins. And wow, what a performance by the man from Ramsey. Well, the light came on at Promly Mona to signal the arrival of number six, Cameron Donald, but he's failed to appear. Now, we reckon that Cameron may have made a mistake on that lap, so possibly an overshoot at signpost. That seems one logical explanation for that. There we've just got another machine coming in now, it'll be Guy Martin, it's in now, Guy's just coming into the top of the pit lane now, and it's Connor, it's on the way, he's just been told there, bring it home, Connor, bring it home, he knows he's got a 21.1 at Glen Helen on this lap, 23.3. Well, that's the klaxon going, Hutchie leads now, and Cameron, he'll be kicking himself for that mistake, he's now dropped to 13. Oh, Connor stalls, Connor stalls! Is he going to get it going here now, it just won't fire up, but quite a bit of time, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on! Oh, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine! It's fine. Oh, Big shake of the head for the big man from Ramsey there. Guy Martin goes as well, and Guy fast into the speed limiter there and nails it, Charlie Lambert. So a 21 second lead, and all of a sudden it was down to four seconds. 17 seconds disappeared during the course of that problem of getting the big ZX10 fired up again. So it's all to play for then in the final two laps, and there's some work to be done by Cameron to eat into Connor's lead. So Connor Cummins, Ian Hutchinson, Guy Martin and uh, Michael Dunlop, those are the top four. The order is the same, but the gap has most certainly changed. First of the late numbered runners now in pit lane. And here's number 26, Paul Dobbs, racing with the Kiwi on his helmet. And there's Jenny away now. And we've just had news that Connor's missing. Connor Cummins missing here at Glen Helen. Wave yellows out here as a machine comes into view now. No, it's not Connor either. That's number eight. Guy Martin, Connor missing at Glen Helen. Yeah, I can tell you what's happened to Connor. He's a retirement mechanical failure at Laurel Bank. A retirement at Laurel Bank, a mechanical failure. Huge disappointment there for Connor. So it's Ian Hutchinson, number four, who's leading on the road. It's number eight, Guy Martin, into second place for now. Numbers one, two, three, into view now. Those three are going to have a real old scrap over the mountain. That's going to be well worth looking at. It's not only Connor that has bad news. We've just heard that the new timing system here in the pits has claimed its first high-profile victim, with Guy Martin picking up a 30-second time penalty. That's moved him down from what would have been second place down to fourth place. So off the podium for Guy and Ian Hutchinson. 
The 30-year-old from Bingley in Yorkshire is the leader of the Superbike TT with Michael Dunlop now in second place. I know a touchy winning, but keep an eye on number six, Cameron Donald, despite that excursion at signpost, finishing the race very strongly indeed, and that final place on the podium is not nailed just yet. Checkered flag is now being prepared. Here comes the wheelie of Ian Hutchinson, and Ian Hutchinson wins on the Padgett Honda. The final results: she Hutchie one, Dunlop two, Donald three, Guy Martin finishing in third place, and it was a time penalty that uh, cost Guy so dearly. So when I was in pit lane, I heard him announce that Guy had gone through the speed lane too fast, and there was a time penalty against him. Now that's all I've heard. We just lost second place. When Pierre was told he just jumped off the bike, got into his van, he didn't even take his helmet off. But I'm sure he will come back again. You know. it's, it's a big disappointment to the guy. You know. He's just done 224 miles at, at those speeds, and then I'm told we're penalising you for nothing. Such a tiny thing, 0.1 over 60. There shouldn't be a 30 second penalty. Five, possibly. That's harsh. They're measuring um, the average speed over a distance. Now, who's to say that their distance that they're measuring over is accurate to within a millimetre? We have book rules and regulations, by the way. And unfortunately, I, I, I perhaps also ought to say that in the matter of timekeeping, uh, the timekeeper has word is law, and he records what are then considered to be matters of fact, from which there is no protest or appeals. OK. Yeah, well, that's it. Monday's a new day, isn't it? And, you know, Guy's got another two races on Monday, so, you know, as long as Guy turns up this evening and open-minded and puts today's race behind him, you know, he's got another superbike race as well on Friday, um, you know, we'll, we'll just move on from it. Action on the mountain course, two races, 600cc machines off first and 10.45. Guy Martin has blitzed them from the start. At the last, Guy Martin is still leading the race by just over a second from Ian Hutchinson with Dan Mead in third place. Guy Martin is here at Ramsey Hairpin, left one, and he still leads, and he looks determined today. News from the top of the mountain from the bungalow is that Ian Hutchinson has halved the gap on Guy Martin, and it is Ian Hutchinson who leads at the end of the first lap. Guy Martin obviously likes that stretch of course between the grandstand and here, because he's consistently quicker, but Hutchinson seems to get in on him everywhere else. His trouser bulging excitement here. Guy Martin is leading the race. Now Ian Hutchinson has gone back into the lead. It's Guy Martin back into the lead. There's Hutchie now leading on the road. Oh, it's quick as that. Charlie, what's the difference as Guy comes in? 3.3 seconds, so Hutchie has been going away a little bit. Guy Martin's been told that you can do this, and I'm sure there's thousands of you out there would like him to do this. Did Guy have problems there on the way? We heard a lot of shouting. Guy goes through with Keith Abor hot on his tail. Michael Dunlop slots into third, but it is Ian Hutchinson who's extended the lead. It's now over four seconds. Stand by your bed because the news from Balaf is that Guy Martin has halved the gap. Ian Hutchinson is coming towards the end of the race, but Guy Martin has now got it down for less than three seconds at the clock. Guy Martin is having the lap of his life. But is it going to be enough to give him his first victory here at the TT? And Hutchie crosses the line right now, but where is Guy? He started 40 seconds after Hutchie. He's started the stopwatch, and we're going to be counting it all the way down to those 40 seconds. 30 seconds. 38, it's 39. It is victory for Ian Hutchinson by 3.0. Guy Martin is in second place. Michael Dunlop is in third place with a final lap of 126.587. The 1, 2, 3 is Hutchinson, Martin and Michael Dunlop and it's down to Chris Kidley. I don't know where um, Tim, where's it? Guy gone to actually? I can tell you he went straight Did not come into the winner's enclosure. He went straight up the return. I'll have to find out what's going on there. Okay, Charlie, can you see? There's people on the paper, but it's nothing to do with us. Hey. Paul's trying to do it. You know what I mean? It's not Paul. Paul doesn't make the rules. Now, this is me being. Yeah, we're all really proud of you. It's just please. Come on, guys. Come on, guys. Wouldn't you be pleased? Yeah, guy, I'd be upset, but I wouldn't take out on the people that's supposed to be yeah. me. Five, one, one, two. Whoa, 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 guy, guy, brakes, brakes, fun brakes, fun brakes. I'm gonna hold this bomb in a minute. Now then, boss. Yeah, right, Where'd boss. you go? 60.112. That's you, boys, being picky. This is me being picky. I'll do what I want at my speed. 
So this is Saturday's race you're on about, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. no. We'll let you get down the bottom there, and we'll have a longer chat later on. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Guys, off there now. So that was a, a bit of a Guy Martin protest we saw there. You going straight in? By what? At point one one two over a kilometre an hour. Do you know how far I go? Point one one two over a kilometre. How far is that? Let me see you. It's been a terrific morning's racing, and these guys will remember this for one reason or another for a very long time. And Guy Martin is not hanging around at the top of the podium. He's already making his way down. He's taking his bottle of bubbly with him, though. Tell me about how you feel. They've been awkward with me. I'll be awkward with them. I'll have to do things. They want you, oh, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, you know, press this, press that. Fuck it off. Yeah. They've been awkward with me. I'll be fucking awkward with them. That's simple. No problem. No don't worry, that's only the tip of the iceberg. You wait till I win a fucker. I don't even think about it really, man. Just agree with them. You're better off. Out, I say, was just out grapes. Anything at all, I say. I could have said out. So I'll, I had to do an interview yesterday morning. You know, I just said, oh, I was happy to finish fourth. Happy. It's where I wanted to be. Obviously not, I wanted to win it, you know. But they're not helping you with dickheads like that, are they? Oh, well. Worst thing's happened to see. We're still here, aren't we? Yeah, we've gone running well. Obviously not well enough. What would you be with? Yeah, I know what needs to be done. Well, there's another three races left yet, isn't there? It'll come. And that is the race leader, Ryan Farquhar, really looking dialed in. Something must have gone wrong at the start for Guy, he was well outside the top ten. It's Hutchie's victory by 1.3 seconds. Hutchie, Ryan and Connor in that order. It's Patrick Hutchie winning three GTs in a week and there are still two solo GTs to go. I just give it absolutely everything I could and just unbelievable, man, unbelievable. After that I hear the ocean beat upon the shore outside my room Calling me out from sleep to listen to Graceful tune. She makes me feel alive. Her power, more than words can say. Some chills through my purse, all clears my head to face my day. Mm -hmm, I pray. Mm -hmm, the times will rise and fall again. Mm -hmm. Hello. Ah. Uh. All right, driver, are you? What do you know? Not all. Well, I just sat watching some onboards while getting a plan of attack, so if... Jeffrey's is from 2002, and then bits of Ulchie. I'm going through the tight sections too hot, and then I'm losing the run onto the long straights. I see the sun rise up into a cloudless sky of blue Cooks and shadows I've just seen Paul Dobbs, that's maybe gone a word with their dogs. Good morning, Paul. How are you doing? What about today's conditions? You bet you were sat when you woke up this morning, you must have thought, oh no. Oh, teammates with Oatsy this year, and he assures me that it's going to come right, so. All right, Paul, I'll let you get together and get warm. It looks freezing. You're looking as if you're not ready for a race either. That's quite near. I mean, that's not safe, is it? No, so you can't go racing, I ain't racing.
he has because Michael Dunlop crosses the line, but it is Ian Hutchinson who has won the race, and not just that, he has made the most amazing piece of history here today. The first man in history to win the first four TT races, and only the second man after Philip McCallum to win four in a week. Ian Hutchinson, the new king of the mountain, no question about that. James McBride away now. Next away will be New Zealand's finest, Paul Dobbs, and right behind his Welshman, Paul Owen. Great to see the man from Langotland here once again. Well, we're on the start line, and then shake hands with your mate, and always wish him all the best. I set off behind my mate, Paul Dobbs, because you're 10 seconds apart. You can count them when they just disappear. You start counting. You can hear them coming down from the campsite, down in the dip and then back up. You can hear them speed coming out there and you can tell the men from the boys. Because they gear down, they drop a cog down um, and then they, they ease off slightly, then they open it up and rip it around the corner. But I have to say the top boys, they just don't bother, they just keep it going flat. He just came around the corner so well, clipped it, the bike went, the, the height of the bus stop, it just went straight up and the height of the bus stop, that's down there like a battle round. I was just closing on him and then we come up to Balagheri and I just seen him go off into the corner and then the yellow flags come out so I knew uh, there'd been an incident he, I'd really blown the engine or crash so I could like hear the other riders come in so I just grabbed a flag and just run into the track to slow the other riders down. The medics tried everything they could for him but yeah, he'd have been cheesed off if he'd have been in the car and got squashed by a tractor or some like like, like we're here, we race, we know the dangers. It's not tiddlywinks or whatever. Well, yeah, that's why everybody gets on if you can help each other. But sadly, he'd lost his life to the sport that he loves, like so. Just one of them, mate. I had one of those moments, you know, that happen at some point, once or twice during every TT fortnight, and I just stand and look around, and, and everything you see, the bikes, the overalls, you know, you hear that siren, pit entry siren, or everything going on, I just thought, I love this. And I actually thought, <laughs> stupid moment of clar clarity. God, I'd miss this if I couldn't have it, because something happens to Dobsey. <laughs> An hour later. Anyone could lose their partner tomorrow. People step out under a bus. People are lost every day. You, you talk about that and joke about it all the time, you know. I might not be here next week, is what people say. But when it is part of your consciousness, even a subconscious part, it really does make you love life. It makes you appreciate who you've got and what's special about them, and just how lucky you are. The reason we make that choice to go racing is just the whole, um, you know, we're here for a good time. What can, you know, how can we get the most fun out of life? And we want the kids to share that as well. They're, they come along, they love it, they're part of it. Because we had that time with them, it's made us who we are, it's made them who they are. You know, they're, they're incredible. Um, they're strong, they're fun, and we have fun. You know, we have so much fun. It doesn't stop, and we're gonna keep on having fun. You know, ride the bikes, play the music, dance in the kitchen. You know, still love the TT, still love the island, you can't change that. You can't love the death, you can't love the loss, but you can't love the, the excitement and the thrill without knowing that that's part of it. It wouldn't be so exciting if it didn't have the risk. That's why they want to do it.
A second rider was killed in yesterday's Supersport 2 race. 48-year-old Austrian Martin Roik died in a crash at Quarry Bends. A statement from the incident. This is Friday. Senior day. This is the day we've all been waiting for. It's the final. And it's the, the race of the year as far as we're concerned. A big prize. People call it the power and the glory. It just means so much. So we will be putting a big effort into this, a huge effort. Everyone's ready and Guy is up for it. So uh, he's just arrived. <laughs> That's him on the, <laughs> on the dirty old bicycle, the push bike. <laughs> Will it be an unbelievable five for Ian Hutchinson? Can John McGuinness? At a second, at a fourth, yesterday, at a fifth in the So I've not had the best of weeks, really. There's a few little issues in the way of just bike itself, but it's all food for thought. And I've got to try and take them through into today's race and go play the part and see what I can do. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to try my hardest, but then sometimes I've been looking, I've been watching on boards, I've been watching this and watching that. And am I trying too hard? And I think I look in a couple of places I am. And that's what's holding me back. So, yeah, I'll put my finger out. That penalty, I didn't feel really hard, but done by it. Worst thing definitely to say, I just come sat in here with my helmet and my boots, my gloves, my leathers and all that shit on. I just sat here and... At the time, if someone had come in here, if Mr Speedgun Man or whatever had come in here, I'd have thrashed fuck out of him. <laughs> but, really, Mr Speedgun Man, I'd have thrashed fuck out of him. I'm not a fighting man, but there's a time and a place for everything. And someone's like that going on. Point, whatever it was. I don't even get me started on it. One four so far, and it'd be great to get the fifth, and you know, it'd be the fairy tale story. But uh, obviously, uh, everyone's been gunning out to get me all week, and I think in some respects, uh, the pressure's kind of off them with it just being one person that's done it all week. What more can they do? It's not as if, you know, there's been four different winners and they haven't won one. It's just. I think maybe the pressure's off them a little bit, but um, on the other side of it, it's the last race this year, and you know if they really are determined to win a TT this year, this is this is a last chance. If you go out there with your head riled, you know if I listen to Rage Against Machine before I go out, you're going out there with the wrong frame of mind. So I'm going to go out there and listen to. I think I might have a bit of Otis Redding on before I go out. Yeah, smoke me ten Bensons. <laughs> You went 10 Bensons? Oh dear, isn't it? Yeah, I'm, taking, I'm taking up smoking. I'm taking up smoking after July. But there's been a few moments in this past couple of weeks where I've just thought... But I've not... I've not, I've, I've not smoked. So I think a bit about it's Redding on the start line. Pretend to smoke a fag. And take it as it comes. Well, the parade lap is coming to its conclusion here. We're going to have the senior TT race going in just under an hour's time at half past 12. And we will, of course, give you all the build up and the interviews as the riders get out. is the number one machine of Bruce Anstey. The lap record still standing at 31.578 miles an hour. That's set by John McGuinness last year. Less than 10 seconds to go. Well, I can tell the members of the Guy Martin fan club over there on the far side of Glen Cutchery Road that their man is still one of the favourites, along with the big local home number 10, Connor Cummings. The last few seconds tick away, we watch the flag which drops, and we are now racing Bruce Anstey, Mountain Maestro, John McGuinness, now number three, Ian Rock, and that's Hutchie on the number four, Pete Table goes, and Cameron Donald, so Michael is away on the Honda, this is Guy Martin on the Wilson Craig Honda, Guy's off and racing. <laughs> Point four of five of a second from number ten, Connor Cummins. There's only point zero six of a second then between him and number four, Ian Hutchinson, with John McGuinness just point seven four of a second down on him. So one and a half seconds cover the top four here. And a tight line in for number eight, Guy Martin. 131 mile an hour lap for Guy, 131.108. That's Guy Martin's fastest lap ever around the mountain course, and he's absolutely on song today. 
all about those guys on the 8 and 10 plates, Guy Martin and Connor Cummins, but it's so close right behind them, Hutchie and John McGuinness are right there in the mix. has gone into the lead. Connor has snatched the lead from Guy Martin, but there's 0.58 seconds in it. down to fractions of seconds because of the bungalow. Guy Martin has narrowed the gap on Conor Cummins to just one-tenth of a second. That's all there is. It's still desperately, desperately tight. It's Guy right in front of me here now. Red torpedo on the back of his leathers. Uh, yeah, just Christian watch that Levin. speed go up. And Guy Martin, let me just give you his details. 130.642, and he was the race leader at Brockton Motor, but still waiting for Connor. Connor's here, now 130.278. A brand new tyre in for Guy, she fires up and he is away right now, so great pit stop by the Wilson Craig team, and it's the McAdoo boys who are on it now. Time to up, Mark, and Mark just says, go, 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 she fires, and the big man is away now. and Michael Dunlop and Keith Moore appearing here and the road goes quiet here for a moment or two but uh, we're still waiting uh, machine number eight so we don't appear to have a Guy Martin here. Guy Martin is missing. Well, back here in the grandstand, we're not sure if we've got a red flag situation. The race has been stopped. Because a fire engine has to go onto the track. It's clearly something very serious at Balagheri. It's only the second senior race in 100 years to be red flagged. Incident at Balagheri. And uh, Guy Martin hasn't reached Balagheri. Red flag, boys. Red flag. We believe it's Guy Martin, he's, he's crashed and the bike's set fire to a field and uh, that's one of the only times they'll put red flags out. It's got wrenching for everyone, the team are pacing up and down, you can see the team boss's head down, not knowing what's going on, I mean no, nobody knows any better than anybody. first we knew about it was when Guy didn't arrive at Glen Helen. You like to think that it's a mechanical failure rather than a crash. So. But then we heard the hedge was on fire at um, Glen Vine. Only riders and officials are allowed in the park roadway area. Everybody else out, please. Thank you. You could see the fire in the distance about a mile away. There was smoke and one of the hay bales was on fire and they slowed us way down. And then I thought, okay, well, there's the, there's a the hay bale on fire. And then, well, there's the bike in somebody's yard. And I'm like, okay, we're past the incident. A quarter mile later, there was Guy. And I was like, ah, oh, shit. There was an incident. Guy was missing, so it had to be him. Uh, he crashed at something like 170 miles an hour, so he was off at that speed. And uh, of course you worry, you know, you don't jump a bike at 170 miles an hour and get up again. So, yes, we were worried. Paul Dobbs crashed there uh, last night and, uh, you know, he, he didn't make it. So, uh, fingers crossed for Guy, it's hit and miss there, you know. There's no run out as there isn't anywhere on the circuit here. And, Guy seems to have made a little bit of a, a rider error sort of thing, and he's gone into the wall. It's, uh, it's not looking good. I came up on the circuit, 
you know, it just looks like a bomb's exploded when out goes on here. The, the wall and all the bales were on fire. You know, guys laid there in the track, his bikes but split in pieces. Like it's, you know, it's horrendous. Yeah, we, everyone's fingers crossed at the minute to see how guy is. It's just how it is, sort of thing. We all enter it. There's no gun to our heads to enter. We all love it, and at the end of the day, if it goes wrong and the worst does happen, they've died an happy man, like. You know, the show's going on, we've got four laps uh, coming here, we're at three o'clock start. No, it'll be no slower. Now let's give you the track conditions. Road, lack of addition at Balagheri, dry around the rest of the course. Visibility good for that race, Charlie Lambert. Got me fingers crossed for Connor today. He'll be out there giving it the berries as usual. I'm right behind you, Connor, if you're listening. One hundred and fifty point nine two miles. John McGinnis, the race leader in the race before it was abandoned, it is away on number two. This is Ian Hutchinson. And now number ten, Connor Cummins, looking so good for the first couple of laps. He's got to keep it together for the full race today. And here comes the first of those machines. It is McGinnis. Here's Hutchie now, 0.61. That's all there is between the two of them. And sad to report, Michael is a retirement in Joey's. Cameron is off the bike. Here's Connor now, head down. So the big news here at Glen Helen, lap two. McGuinness appears to be out. And it's 3.24 seconds that Ian Hutchinson leads number 10, Connor Cummins. Stand. We have got the situation at the bungalow where Ian Hutchinson retains the lead of the race. We're waiting for Connor to appear at the bungalow before we can update that. News of Connor Cummins, he came off at the veranda and he's receiving attention. So Connor off at the veranda. Ian Hutchinson crosses the line and rides into the history books. Forget the famous five. This is the fabulous, fantastic five by the Bingley Bullet. Ian Hutchinson, 30 years of age. He has rewritten the history books of one of the greatest motorsport events in the world. Again, it was the sound and uh, the blur, but the blur stopped. He's coming around the corner, good race lane, really good race lane, in all fairness to him. Uh, and he was flying around. The bike comes down, um, kicks the bike away, and the bike literally turns into a fireball on impact. It's like the start of a TV programme, like an all-action TV programme, where the screen is filled with flames, and this silhouette comes towards us out of a waist tight, and it's guy. And I'm thinking, oh, here we go, I've got a job. Yeah, the first thing that springs to my mind, like. So um, I reach around, grab my orange box, the, the med box, I turn around there, and guy's flying past me, followed by a, a bike which is on fire, and it just screams past me. And then the bike goes over to one side, and it's still in flames, I mean, it's black smoke everywhere, it's flames, a heck of a mess on there. And guy's in the middle. I told him, I'm not going to cut your leathers, you're here, because you know, I need to check you over the first of all. And he said, you know, oh, don't cut my leathers, don't cut my leathers. Now, I understand that, because I'm a bike guy, like, and that's the last thing I'd want, is somebody to cut my leathers. But he was good. He was good. Definitely somebody was up there watching him. No doubt about it. Lucky guy. I thought, right. Job was looking good. Job was looking good, 131 and a half from a standing start. Um, Flow him to come into the pits, I think 130.6. Battling for the lead. Went out from the pits, got about five mile out Glenvine. Took the front. Thought I got it, thought I got it, got it, got it, got it. So you've had a few moments like this. Where you just ride into the grip that you've got. And I was riding up to that point of, I knew whether it was decent grip. You couldn't really push past that point. But because I just left the pits with another full tank of petrol, and I had this idea in my head, the grip that I could, I'd ride up to. And um, um, obviously not. I think the full tank of petrol probably made a bit of difference. Um, Lost the front, fat front of, you know, one of the fast uh, corners of the track, probably 160, 70 mile an hour. 
and took the front and I thought, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. No, no, I ain't got it. But it's a jump ship. And um, I think I ended up with a few, I've got a few bits of singed eyebrows and eyelashes and singed my fringe and what have you. But it's, uh, I ended up in the wall, I think, but I can't remember much, I was knocked out. But I'm still here. And I'm not bad, really. I mean, it could have been a lot worse, couldn't it? Could have been a lot worse. Yeah, and I think there's nothing, it's only, you know, a bit of bark off my knees and what have you. We're, you know, sliding, when you're sliding at 160, 70 miles an hour, that's a lot of heat, isn't it? You know, I've got a bit, a lot of friction burns from sliding. There's a few broken ribs, punctured lung. Um, four chip vertebrae and two crap vertebrae. Apart from that, I like a new one. So, yeah, just sat here and, and, um, yeah, I think, I think, I, I think here, I, I'm sitting, I'm sat here, I'm moving my legs about, oh, I'm invincible. But then I try and get up and I think, ooh, fucking hell, I'm not, I'm not as good as I think. So like out with the spine, you can't rush it, can you? You know, it's a stable fracture as it is at the moment, but if you push any harder, you know, you can, like Connor is just up the corridor there, not looking clever. You know, his back's a bit worse than mine, and you know, I'm just sending him away to get his, his shoulder and his elbow screwed together. But part of the game, boy. We all know the risk, no one's making us do it out. All part of the game. Put me in that position again, I'll do exactly the same again, boy. Exactly the same again. I'll be back. He's just making me work for it, isn't he? So, I... I think I've had a podium every year since 1997, so, yeah, it seems weird, you know, coming up the access road and, you know, not getting a cheer and a clap and getting way past the rostrum. And I was leading the first race, and it all went wrong, and then the senior, the Blue Ribbon race, I got up to sort of 11 second lead and the guy had the crash and, you know, red flags come out and you've got to come back and tune yourself back in and get dialed in ready for the restart and the restart looking like it was going good and then we had a, a kill switch failure. Two pence wire snaps off the solder brakes and, and just puts you out of contention completely and, uh, you know, that's a TT for you I suppose. I mean, I've had a lot of luck in the past, I've won a lot of races around here and when luck's not on your side, it's not happening for you, you know. And for sure Guy Martin's had a worse day than I had and uh, for sure Kind of Cummins has had a lot worse day than I have. I'm sitting one piece, and you know I'm gonna head for the ferry and get home and get my thoughts together and see what's gonna be available for next year. Or you know, if nothing floats me boat, I might hang my leathers up. You never know. Me and the kids together have had our down times, and I haven't tried to hide anything from them. You know, we've we've done our crying together. And then, okay, what are we gonna do now? Get over it, move on. I think the point of life is to enjoy it, have as good a time as we can while we're here and what we've got given. You can't change what you get given, but you can decide whether or not to enjoy it. I've been to look at where the crash was. There's still bits of like green paint from either my bike or my leathers. So on the cat's eye on the side of the road, I can actually see, you know, where it's all gone wrong. I've disappeared over the side, and the way I look at it, that's where, you know, the injury started to happen, and it's sort of, it does get to you a little bit. The main one was my back. I mean, I broke that in five places, and got a big scar on my back, and then as a result, getting tumbled down the hill and hitting a few things. I mean, I, I broke my arm in four places. Some slight nerve damage to it, but that's coming back nicely. My knee was, Dislocated, a few scrapes. We had a broken, uh, sorry, a fractured pelvis and fractured shoulder blade and a bruised lung as well. So um, it was a it was a bit to take in, really. You know, to get my head round, it was uh, that was a big challenge. You know, mentally, there's no chance I'm giving up. I'm 24 year old, and I perfectly accept I've been really, really lucky. But uh, my love for bike racing is still there, and uh, I've got goals I want to achieve. So the first opportunity I ever get, I'll be straight on it. That's my plan, you know. Come up to the veranda next TT or whenever I get back and uh, just attack it like normal. It was a big one, but we'll just get on with life. <laughs> the world ain't gonna stop for me. Tremendous start round the outside. We think Ian Hutchinson, the five times in a week winner at the TT, uh, may be the lad who's down there. Unfortunately, uh, I've gone to a second to last race of the year on a short circuit, not a road race, and ended up with this injury. So 
I mean, it's a shame how it happened, you know, to be ridden over by somebody else. You know, when it happened and they were talking about amputating my leg, then uh, there was only one reason I didn't want it amputating, and that's so I can race a motorbike, you know. Apart from that, nothing else really matters, so... You know, my argument was to get my foot back on, and uh, not only get it on, I said, you know, I don't want a foot just on the end of my leg, I want a foot that's 100% working, so I can get on with my job. Something happened. Couldn't have been a better time for it to happen, obviously, seven months until the start of the season, so... I just got to get on with it and, uh, you know, get back to fitness for, for the start of next year. See?